and welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. But today's talk is a little different. We've got a very special guest. His name is Dr. Jeffrey Siegel. Now, he's not only a board-certified neurosurgeon who trained at Baylor College of Medicine, he also just happens to have graduated from Concord Law School, um, so he's also an attorney, and um, he's also a partner at Bertadotto Law Firm in North Carolina. So Dr. Siegel launched a company called Medical Justice in 2002, and Medical Justice is the physician-based organization focused on keeping doctors from being sued for frivolous reasons. That's why he's on here. This is becoming more and more of an issue. So Dr. Siegel also founded eMerit to help doctors protect and preserve their reputations, particularly online. Now, Dr. Siegel has established himself as one of the country's leading authorities on medical malpractice and online reputation. And I hear him talk at the meetings all the time. He's a really popular, he's got such a popular topic because it's a hot topic <laughs> and it probably always will be. So Dr. Siegel, welcome to Beauty in the Biz. Hey, Catherine, thanks for allowing me to participate. Absolutely. Um, just out of sheer curiosity, how does how does one go from a neurosurgeon, because that didn't take a couple of minutes, that took years and years to become one, to then become a lawyer, and that took a whole lot of time, to then become more entrepreneurial? What was that path like? Well, it's interesting because I did not intend that to be the case. And it's like having that conversation with your parents and your wife, how that happens. Um, in between, I was in biotechnology. So I practiced as a neurosurgeon for a decade, perfectly happy doing that. And then I had a son who became ill. He's better now. But I took a year off. We moved to North Carolina to seek services for him. And I became persuaded that a certain set of pharmaceutical compounds might help him. And in that process, went to where they were on a shelf, University of North Carolina, licensed those compounds, raised money, and started a biotechnology company. So if um, ha knowing what I now know, I probably would not have done it, but we we're able to move these compounds pretty far along from preclinical to phase two, get the company sold to a medical device company. By then, a number of years had gone by. The question was whether I can go back to practicing neurosurgery. I thought since so many years had gone by, it'd be a challenge to, you know, to reasonably persuade a patient to go under the knife. Even though I'm arrogant enough to believe I could do it, I'm not sure I had these, the persuasive skills to do that. So I formed medical justice and got a law degree along the way. So in some sense, you could just say I'm confused. In other sense, you can say I'm a lifelong student. We're probably right. both right. Right. <laughs> so the, the thing about frivolous lawsuits, how did that come about? Because you wouldn't have had that issue as a neurosurgeon, but you certainly would as a solo practitioner, plastic surgeon. So how well, did you segue into that world? Yeah, it's a great question. I actually did have it happen to me as a neurosurgeon. Oh. And I was sued one time for what I perceived to be a frivolous reason. The single expert who testified against me had actually been expelled previously from our professional society, the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. Why? Because he was delivering frivolous testimony. Yet, even though he'd been booted out of our Profession society, there he was on the circuit making a very handsome living, testifying, saying one thing on one coast, saying the exact opposite on another coast. But his core competence was he um, had good communication skills. He could speak well to a jury. So he was in demand. In any event, um, I, he had never seen or done the case at issue, but it didn't stop him from running his mouth. The case was dismissed about two weeks before trial. I never felt as if I lost, uh, won anything. I just felt as if I lost less. And I thought there has to be a better way. So we started medical justice as a way of holding proponents of these frivolous lawsuits accountable. In one sense, what do we do? We sue lawyers that inappropriately sue doctors. And more broadly, over time, we've expanded our mission to deal with all types of conflicts. Goal is to de-escalate a conflict I mean, by the time people get to lawyers, there's a lot of conflict in the background. And there are, and in fact, this is probably a good segue to talk about, well, what kind of conflicts are there? What types of, what right. types of saber rattling takes place? And well, all types. Um, the, it typically gets started with yelling, screaming, or nasty emails. Somebody doesn't, somebody says they don't like how they were treated, for example. That's the lowest level. 
or they could put a nasty note on the internet or they can file a complaint to the board of medicine. All of that requires no effort whatsoever. Um, they could sue you in small claims court. They could hire a lawyer to send a threatening demand letter or they can sue you. So a gazillion ways for a conflict to take place. That's the bad news. The good news is there are ways if you are attentive uh, to the process to head this off at the pass before there's litigation, before there's a nasty note on the Internet, before they even start yelling at you. There are plenty of ways to identify trouble before it shows up at your door and avoid this before it creates a headache. Well, I'll tell you, um, being a cosmetic patient myself um, and just and just being in this industry for decades, I have noticed that a lot could have happened at the beginning to prevent the drama happening at the end. And um, let's just talk about patient selection. I know so many surgeons, and I don't know if it's arrogance or just whatever, but they don't want to say no to, to the surgical procedure or the money or whatever. And they always think they're going to be able to handle it. Even if staff is saying, I don't know about this one, I'm not feeling good about that. Can we just start there? Like, what what can they do to just cut it off at the beginning? Yeah. So the first thing is to select your patients carefully. It's a cash pay business. There's this tendency to want to get everybody through the door. Nobody will ever have on their epitaph, I wish I had done one more patient. That that epitaph does not exist on a gravestone. So be there are a handful of patients you not only should say no to, you must say no to. They're not great candidates for surgery. You may believe they have a cosmetic problem or an aesthetic problem that you can solve, but that's not their underlying problem. If a patient comes in there and says, hey, look, I just want to take three or four years off. I just want to feel better. That's probably a good candidate for a procedure. If a patient comes in and says they're struggling to put food on the table and a roof over their head and they're struggling financially, or if they believe that the procedure will shave off 30 years, or if the procedure will um, save their marriage, not a great candidate. Those are people who have expectations that cannot be managed. You cannot manage those expectations. The best thing to do is to say no. And the other thing is that there are cash pay businesses where a patient will have a particular budget and you say, I can't do that for you, but I can do something at 10% of that cost. But you know, in your heart of hearts, it's not really going to do what the patient wants. Uh, they'll be back. They will believe they will have believed that somehow they're getting a permanent solution when they're only getting a four-week solution. Expectations aren't managed. Just don't do it. I'm telling you that the amount of extra revenue that you get for that one patient will pale, pale in comparison to the headache that you will experience. And I've often said that um, in, with the benefit of hindsight, if you had known that this particular patient would cause this much agony in your life, would you have paid them? Would you have given them a check in advance of seeing you to stay out of your practice? 100% of practices say, yes, I would have paid them. I'm still waiting for the one to say, no, I, I probably would not have paid them to stay away. No, they, they, will, they will tear your soul out and they'll rip out you know, your, you know, your desire to practice a medicine right out your bone marrow. Do you have a professional way to tell a patient no? Because I have found these patients are still going to slam you online when you say no. You know, is there a, a, the right way to do it without them giving you a bad review about it? Um, maybe. I think, I, I'm going to say up front that even if, first of all, you should be capturing feedback from patients so that if you get the inevitable bad review, it's not a showstopper. It's not going to destroy your practice. In fact, I will argue having an occasional negative review amongst a sea of positive reviews is actually a good thing. I think it's actually better than having 100% positive reviews. Why? Because it demonstrates demonstrates authenticity, credibility, et cetera. If you have 100% five-star reviews, let's say you have 500 five-star reviews and it just says, great doctor, I love you. You know, there's no meat uh, to, uh, to the review. It, it looks like marketing material, but having an occasional negative reflects reality. The public knows you cannot make everybody happy. The Ritz-Carlton doesn't make everyone happy. The public wants to see how you can solve a problem. 
So if you have an unhappy patient and you at least work to try to solve their problem, you can tele- telegraph that in a HIPAA compliant way. Good for you. I think you're better off. Now, when you get that negative review, you don't feel like sending flowers and chocolate to that patient, of course, but you should. You probably should only because I think holistically it's it's helping you. But anyway, back to your very good question. How do you gently give somebody the boot, if you will, you know, without being offensive. And I think the way to do it is to validate them, say, look, um, I'm not disagreeing with your, you know, with your treatment plan, what you're requesting. I just do not believe I will be able to meet your expectations. I'm not suggesting no one will be able to meet your expectations. I just don't believe that I can meet them. And I, I just want you to be happy. I want you to be happy. And in doing so, I don't think it would be a good idea for me to take your money, ultimately go through a procedure, and you not be satisfied or happy. Now, that will work with most people. Um, there are There's a small subset of patients who do not have a core aesthetic problem. They have a mental health problem. The mental health problem may be something like body dysmorphic disorder, just to give this a, a name. And there, it's a body image problem. It doesn't matter what they see in a mirror. Um, they don't, they experience a different image. And when you operate on somebody with body dysmorphic disorder or BDD, you're actually doing them a disservice. I mean, arguably it's malpractice, but I would just say, you know, more, more charitably, you're doing them a disservice. And the proper thing to do is to refer them to a healthcare professional, mental health professional who deals with body image problems. Um, You know, as an aesthetic practitioner, you do what you know how to do. But let's say, for example, a patient came in there and they had had a kidney stone or say they had a chest pain. You'd send them to a urologist for the kidney stone. You'd send them to a cardiologist for chest pain. You would properly refer them. If you can identify, if you can make a presumptive diagnosis of something like BDD, having a pre-existing relationship with a mental health professional that you can gently pass the baton over uh, to for additional screening, you're doing them a favor. And in some sense, you could say, I'm not saying no forever. I'm just saying no for now. I just want you to be screened and be evaluated by somebody that I know, somebody that I trust, and they can give you clearance. Um, But if you've got a good screening tool for BDD, being able to gently get them referred to the proper individual, in many sense, I mean, you were really doing them a favor. Will they write you a bad review? Typically, they will not. Can I promise they will never write a bad review? No, I can't. But I I can tell you that if you, you do the right thing most of the time on balance, you will be better off than operating on that passion or just kicking them out the door and saying, I can't help you. Just good luck with life. But now that we have social media, I see every day, I I don't know if it's BDD or whatever you want to call it, but the outrageous big boobs, big butt, little waist, huge lips. Is that BDD or is that just, what is that? You tell me. Um, Yeah. So I'd have to plead ignorance there. Um, I'm in North Carolina. I don't see it as frequently as as perhaps you do on, on the West Coast. But but you know, I've been to Miami and I've definitely see it there. And I can I can tell a trend. And every three or four years, the trend changes so that it's something else. Um, I think you just got to do what you do, okay? And if if the patient wants something that is outrageous they'll eventually get it done. There's always somebody who will do it. Even Remember, Michael Jackson was able to find a doctor to put him to sleep at night and ultimately put him to sleep permanently. But you don't have to be that. You don't have to be Michael Jackson's doctor. You, you, you just do good work. You'll have a good practice. Um, don't feel compelled to have to do outrageous things just to, just to keep the lights on. Most people are reasonable. I know sometimes it's hard to believe that, but most people are reasonable and want reasonable things. And if somebody's pushing the envelope to get you to do things that you're not comfortable, things that you think are not within the standard of care, just say no. Because if you if you do say yes, sooner or later you're going to get burned. And I, I is it BDD? I don't know, but I know it's not something that 
I know that most pra- practitioners should stay away from. Let's just talk about, you know, um, you know, putting in breast implants that are ginormous. Okay, um, it's possible that there will never be a complication associated with that, but it's just physics. You're putting in a a mass um, under uh, the skin or under the muscle. And if the skin or muscle has to stretch beyond what it's capable of doing and it outstrips its blood supply, I can tell you with 100% certainty what's going to happen, that the skin is going to slough off, the implant will be exposed, and it's going to get infected. And then the implants are going to need to be removed. Now, they may not have liked their breast beforehand, but I can assure you they're not going to like having a giant gaping hole in their breast without any mass in it. I think to to me, that's a worse outcome, but all you can do is what you can do. You can try and persuade them based on the best evidence and your judgment. And if you say no, maybe we'll go somewhere to say yes. But I I know that you can't beat physics 100% of the time. That much I'm confident of. So what about the patients who schedule surgery, put down the deposit, then change their minds, cancel the surgery? Now they want their deposit back. Um, the date can't be filled or they're scrambling to try to fill that date. Who I realize that's the patient's problem. It, you know, they cause that. However, what's the best way to handle that because of this online situation? Um, you know, they'll, they'll be online saying, I can't get my money back. The guy stole my money. Um, mm-hmm. How do you handle that when a patient reneges on what they promised? This is a challenge, and I have changed my opinion on this over time. If you had asked me 15 years ago, I would say a deal is a deal. You basically stuck your deposit down. That's I scheduled you for surgery. I wasn't guaranteeing you an operation. I was guaranteeing you a slot on the schedule, and I honored my end of the bargain. I'm keeping the money. So that was Jeff Siegel, me speaking 15 years ago. I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind over time because here's what I think happens. I think if you're dealing with a significant sum of money here, you're putting the patient in a bind. The bind being that they are being forced to choose between forfeiting a large amount of money, let's say it's $10,000, just to make this a round number, or have a procedure they don't want to have. Have a procedure they don't, an elective procedure they don't want to have. And what I've seen over time is that if you push them into that situation, they'll ultimately have the procedure. They're not going to forfeit the money, but that's when the fireworks begin. They'll have the procedure. You will have done what you what, what you you know what you said you would do. You honored your end of the bargain. Then they're going to tell you how horrible you did the job. They don't believe it, but they're going to tell you how horrible a job was. And they're going to demand their money back. They're going to demand their money back or slam you on the internet. So as unsavory as it is to just swallow hard and let them go, I would probably most of the time give them their money back. Now, I think it depends on the situation. If it's if the patient has a good reason for um, for canceling the procedure and if they gave you adequate advance notice and you could potentially fill the slot, I'm saying just do the be good, be, be a nice person and give the back, particularly if you can fill the slot, okay? Because really, you haven't been injured, you haven't been harmed, and you're just trying to be nice and do the right thing. If they have a medical event or a life event that took place and it looks like they really do want the surgery down the road, just ask them gently, you know, would you like to postpone this at no charge and we'll do this when the dust is settled? You know, it sounds like you're going through a lot of life stressors right now. This is an entirely elective procedure. You don't have to have it done, but if you think you want to have it done, we'll just go ahead and, you know, keep your funds, um, you know, stored away. And we'll, you know, we won't raise our rate for you because typically we will raise rates, you know, twice a year, once a year, and we'll honor our end of the bargain and flesh that out. But if they basically just say, look, it's the day before the surgery, I'm canceling. Do I have a reason? No, I have no reason. I just don't want it. What don't you understand about that? And um, that's a nasty individual, okay? And do you really want that as your patient? I mean, I I think you're probably better off not operating on that individual and just flipping it around and uh, giving them the cash back. I mean, to me, deposits are mostly there to get people to commit to a date and it serves its purpose. It gets people, it puts something on a calendar. So when I say I'm going to, I plan on going to Europe, to me, that's a wish. 
It, it has no substance whatsoever. Once I stick that on the calendar, that baby's real. I'm going. I know I'm going. And so, yeah. Once you buy an airline ticket, it's real. Um, now, you know, if I, I can change my mind and I can cancel the flight as, as I just did for my wife the other day. Um, so now she's got X number of um, months to go ahead and use those dollars for something else. But um, I mean, over time, we've, hotels and airlines have kind of figured out how to find that nice balance between the two, at least holistically. You may get screwed on a particular patient, but um, in aggregate, I think you'll be better off by adopting that philosophy. Well, here's another thing that can go sideways. You've had your surgery. And now you, as a patient, you get this bill and it's for another thousand dollars for OR and anesthesia because the doctor took longer than expected. I personally thought, why is that my problem? Like well, I'm the patient, he's the expert. Why am I paying for him to take longer than he said he was going to? Wait, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I don't disagree with that, um, with your interpretation of that. I mean, look, in the elective space, people are looking for um, one-shop pricing. They're not looking for surprises. If it's the insurance world, it's not really your money. I mean, let let Blue Cross manage that. Not my problem. And once you've hit your deductible, just break out the champagne. I'll have everything done, you know. But um, I mean, if if indeed there's going to be extra fees related to taking more time, um, then the rational argument is, well, do I get money back if the surgeon was fast? If the surgeon was faster and only took half as much time because I was simple, do I get a refund? And we know the answer to that. The answer is that a big N-O. So if I, I think the proper way to do it is to try and work with facilities and other professionals who are willing to accept fixed fees with the understanding is that you are already arbitraging this. You have more knowledge than the patient and you're in aggregate, you're going to come out ahead. If you basically say, I'm going to accept the risk of the case going longer, I'm just going to eat it. But you know, in your heart of hearts that you're benefiting by the case going, if you can stuff in more cases, good for you. You've, you've actually benefited. So I, I think Barring extremely unusual circumstances, you're probably better off eliminating surprises to patients. Nobody likes a surprise. I know I don't like a surprise. You know, when I get a letter from the IRS, if it doesn't have a check in there for me, I'm I'm not happy. That's an un that's an ugly surprise. And even if I do get a check and I'm not expecting it, that's also an ugly surprise because if you cash that check, you're going to get hosed a year from now. So my my larger point is. Try to eliminate surprises for those in the cash pay business, and you'll eliminate future headaches for yourself. Oh, and let me tell you another thing: avoid billing patients for twenty-four dollars and thirty-two cents. You know, it just pisses people off. Now, particularly if they're not expecting it, I've seen people sent to collections for under twenty-five dollars. I don't get that. I don't get it because if the patient is unhappy or suffered a complication, and they they just ate it and they learned to live with it, that's the that's the one thing that rubs salt in their wound. It's it's a it's an unforced error. You don't need to do it. If you've got a $24 bill with a hangover, write it off. Just well, write it off. Here's the next surprise that comes up. The patient has their procedure. They're not happy with their result. The doctor agrees and says, um, I'll I'll do a tweak in the office if possible. Mm -hmm. If he can't, he says I'll, we'll go back to surgery, but you're paying the OR and the anesthesia and I, I will forfeit my fee. Again, the patient says, why am I paying for this? It's, you know, you are the expert, you did it, you can see there's a problem. And I know that's murky because sometimes the doctor can't see there's a problem, um, but oftentimes right. there really is. I mean, he did, he, he does need some kind of revision to be made. Um, how, how tricky is that? Or is it more black and white than it seems? Because I, as me as a patient, if I see something's wrong, I mean, but I'm reasonable too. What if it's a reasonable revision? Yeah. So um, the answer, I'm going to give you a lawyerly answer. Okay. It depends. Every, every doctor is different. Every patient is different right here. I would say if you're going to do a revision procedure where you waive your professional fee, then um, 
you do want to spell out in advance who is responsible for anesthesia and the facility, okay? And try that. That's a trial balloon. See how it goes. Um, if the patient thinks that's reasonable, they'll sign off on it. Get them to sign off on it. Get them to say, here's the deal. The deal is this. And most of the time they'll say yes, but not always. Then you got to recognize who is that individual that is going to need something more just to solve their problem. Do I, would I roll over? I probably, I might, I might. I'm actually thinking about myself at that point. I'm thinking about, do I want to go to World War III over a modest amount? Um, and, or do I, will I eat some of that fee even partly because I already received a large amount of money from them in the first place. Now, is it as much? No, but is this really going to change my financial statement at the end of the year? No, it's really not. And if I'm already psychically invested in this particular case and it's starting to raise my blood pressure at this stage of my life, I'm going to opt to decrease my blood pressure. It's not going to bother me one bit. But that's me. I, I th again, if you had asked me 20 years ago, I would have given you a completely different answer. I would have gone to war. Uh, the, the reason patients will go online typically, I will just say in general, because I talk to them all the time, is because nobody fixed their problem. They had a problem. Nobody heard them or listened to them or did anything about Repeat it. Repeat what you just said. That's the most important point of this conversation. They did not feel listened to. They didn't feel listened to. Listen to them. If you listen to them, they'll give you the answer. Still, Sir William Osler said the patient will deliver the diagnosis to you. And here it's the same thing. It's a communication issue. If you stop talking for a moment and you start listening, they'll tell you their perception of what they believe the problem is. Then you've got a question. Can you solve their problem? In my estimation, once you've listened to them, you've already, you've, you're 90% of the way there to solving their problem. You may have to go a little bit more and some problems cannot be solved. I, I don't, I agree. Not every problem can be solved, but where else do you get 90% success rate? I think that's pretty good. That, those are pretty good odds. Um, when you do know it's not your best work and the patient knows that too, like everyone knows that, um, but you don't want to do it again. You're, you're kind of done with it. What is the easiest way to detangle? I personally, I like the refund idea, the one with, and you agree not to disparage yeah. me in any way, shape, or form, is that still the best way to handle that? Or what is your approach? A couple ways to do that. That, to me, is tried and true, meaning that patient's unhappy. You may, it may not be your best work. It could have been the patient, you know, biology is biology, and it is what it is. But um, being open to the idea in the cash pay field of giving the patient their money back, you give, you get. You give, you get. So what do you want from the patient? I want to release. I want two things, no legal mischief, no online mischief. And 99% of the time, they think that's a pretty good deal. And they'll say yes. And you become a beneficiary of that too. And the reason I say you become a beneficiary, if you're seeing a patient 12 times post-op and um, you see the name on the schedule and your sphincter tightens up because you know it's coming in during the day, that eats into your longevity. You're going to live a few minutes less the more, more of those experiences that you have. So in, in a sense, you're paying for longevity. And we, I mean, to me, that's the cheapest way to live longer and live well longer. So yes, you give, you get. It's got to be a nice, crisp release. Um, and a good release is typically five pages long. And, and we, we have those available. Um, something you can also do is um, you could potentially have the patient seen by a colleague of yours that you trust. If you think the patient is not malignant and they're a reasonable human being, but you believe, or both of you believe, that the trust that is necessary in a good doctor-patient relationship is gone, you can offer to say, look, I know that our relationship isn't as good as it could or should be, but I'm open to sending you to somebody that I trust, and I'm hoping you'll trust him or her too. And I, I can get you on their schedule, you know, to be seen ASAP. That often also helps. Now, they may say any friend of yours is an enemy of mine and they don't want to see that person. But by and large, you, you're, get, you're coming up with potential solutions. You're solving a problem here. You um, can always fall back and giving the money back. But sometimes if you can kind of keep it in the fold with people that you know and trust, every, you become a beneficiary of that. And hopefully it solves their problem and they're happy too. So what about arbitration? Because 
I think egos get involved and it gets overblown and a third party that could smooth things out makes sense to me. Um, when do you, how does all that work? The arbitration? Okay. So there are a couple ways to think about this. One is I'll call it um, informal mediation and then arbitration. Let me explain the difference. So sometimes the love is lost that the doctor and patient really do not want to talk to each other any longer. They don't like each other. It's a bad marriage and they need to divorce, but they need to separate amicably. So sometimes hiring an attorney like me, because I will do this, I will reach out to the patient. I'm not formally mediating. I do represent the doctor and I do tell them that, but I'm a person who will actually listen and validate what is obvious. I mean, if a patient had an infection and they had an unexpected complication, I'll just acknowledge the obvious. They're unhappy with how this turned out. Why would, why would, why would they be happy with that? I mean, it makes no sense uh, to, to perceive otherwise. And hopefully we can negotiate a detente, a way out, um, perhaps how to give the patient some or all of their money back. Or we even had it where the doctor will donate to a charity so that something good comes out of this instead. So there are a thousand ways to come to an amicable resolution. So that's that one bucket. The other bucket, arbitration, is more formal. Arbitration is an alternative to court. Arbitration is an alternative to court. So why do I like arbitration? A court is, so what is arbitration? Arbitration is where the sides agree to um, resolve their dispute informally in a private setting, typically with a retired judge, and it'll be private and binding. It'll be private and binding. So why do I like that? Well, to resolve a case in the normal system in a court, it's public. Everybody can see it. They can read everything. And when you're dealing with an aesthetic case, I mean, everybody benefits by this being private. At least I think they do. It's faster, typically, because it's less formal. Typically costs less. Not always, but typically it's less expensive uh, to go through. And it's binding, meaning that you can't appeal it. So when the decision's in, the decision's in. With court, you never know when it ends because you can certainly appeal it. And there could be no end to this stuff, at least, you know, no conceivable end to the process. So I'm a big fan of arbitration. And while I, it clearly benefits the, um, the physician, the doctor, the provider, I also think it benefits the patient. I think everybody benefits from this. So let's say the patient wants to, let's just talk about reviews because reviews are going to be the bane of every plastic surgeon's existence. And I, I feel for them because nowhere else on the planet can you complain about somebody with no recourse at all. And the doctor has, you have I don't know, it's just, it's so unfair um, because most of the time the surgeon is not, their intent is fine. They have no ill intent. Um, and you're getting bashed online um, for things you can't fix. You can't get it down. You can't. Although um, just recently on the West Coast, um, there's a federal lawsuit against a surgeon who was filling around with the reviews. And I hear this a lot. Um, either they're having their staff write good reviews or bad reviews for the competitors or they're paying. Right. For for All unnecessary. Here's the deal. Here's how I would do it. Look, if you're a high-performing practice, doing great work. There are ways to get honest reviews, and they're mostly going to be positive from your patients, but don't filter reviews. It's called review getting. Just have as many patients as you're possible participate in the process. Have it so that it's done at the point of service. I'm making a plug. Our organization does this stuff where the merit, we're not the only one that does it, but aggregating reviews from your patients, not filtering them, not getting them. You will be perceived for the most part for what you are, as long as you get them up there. You will get an occasional negative review. It's inevitable. Everybody gets it. As I told you earlier, having an occasional negative review is actually better than no negative reviews. As much as I you- I tell doctors this all the time. I say, your yeah. 336 five-star reviews is so inauthentic. I, I wouldn't exactly. trust that at all. So and plus who's going to read 336 reviews? Um, people read 10, 15 reviews. They may ask to read the lowest one. Great. Get to the lowest one and then see if there's a HIPAA compliant response. 
did the doctor or the provider take the high ground? Did they try to solve a problem? Do they look to be reasonable? Why? The patient is trying to identify if they become the complainer, will their problem be solved? And that's all they're looking for. They're looking for insurance or reassurance. And typically, it's you can provide it. You can solve that problem. Yeah. Well, a lot of times, too, um, because we patients, we love to look at the one-star review and see what happened. And a lot of times, that one star is so chaotic, um, you can tell it's not a balanced person yeah. who's writing that review. So that's handy. Um, but otherwise, if the reviews are just, he made me wait forever. Um, like th- I hope that's your worst review. Like he was so busy, he, you know, I got two minutes with him. Like that's a that's still a really good review. <laughs> it is yeah. because how does it get positioned? So if he made me wait, it means look, I spent as much time as needed with a particular patient, and if the patient before had a crisis or had additional questions. I gave them the benefit of the doubt. I gave them extra time, just like I'll give to you. If you become that patient, you turn a negative into a positive. If, um, you know, if they say you only spent 10 minutes or not enough time, you go, the, 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 the subtext is that you're so many people want you, you're in demand. The public must know how great you are. So not all of these are really bad. I think the things that are manageable, if there are money issues, you just, put down a statement, which is um, our patients sign off on the um, the expected amount they will pay in advance. And if there's um, if there's a disagreement, they, d- they need to do little more than come to our office and we'll fix it. I mean, it's it's the type of thing. If it's in writing, you're just honoring what's in writing. It is what it is. Um, I think if they're just unhappy and I said Siegel's a butcher, there's yeah. only so much you can do with that. But um, you know, if the patient, for example, had an infection, um, you turn a negative into a positive. You say something to the effect of um, the infection rate for this particular procedure is 2%. In our practice, it's 1%, so it's less than the national average. However, patients are not statistics. Um, a patient either experiences an infection or doesn't, 100% or 0%. But regardless, we'll stand by our patients and try and fix them until they're satisfied, something like that. And so what have you done with that? You're basically acknowledging the obvious that infections do happen, that in your practice, it's lower than the national average. And number three, you'll do your best to try and make it right. That's per- That's a great answer, by the way. And really by the way, answer. there's no violation of HIPAA in the way I just described it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the big ones that end up usually on... TV or something, it's when the doctor didn't respond. Um, they told them they'll be fine. We'll, um, you'll be fine. Uh, just get some rest. And days go by and then it becomes a very big issue. So a lot of this can be prevented, but what's the, what's the most frivolous and the least frivolous? Do you have any like, like uh, extreme examples? Oh my God. For the most frivolous, there's so much attention to that. My, here's my favorite case with the frivolous um, lawsuit. And it's not an aesthetic case, okay, but hopefully you'll bear with me. So a, I believe in this case, it was a urologist in a small town performed a vasectomy on a particular uh, patient. And a year later, the patient's wife became pregnant, okay? A year later, the patient's wife became pregnant. The, the male comes back and is livid just saying that the vasectomy didn't work. Now, by the way, the postoperative sperm count was zero. And in rare cases, it does happen where the the vast deference, which is tied off um, and cut, does come back together. It, it does happen, but that's not what happened here. What happened here is that they lived in a small town and everybody knew that the patient's wife who got pregnant had a lover on the side. So this was a lawsuit. And until they were able to get a paternity test to demonstrate it wasn't his child, um, this was a this was a lawsuit, and I would argue a frivolous lawsuit. So that's one of my favorite cases. I, I typically ask the audience if they have a hypothesis as to how this might have happened. You know, when the patient's wife became pregnant after he had a vasectomy, is there a hypothesis as to how this could potentially have happened? I can't believe and, she let it go that far. Oh, I know. <laughs> and it was a small town, and basically, the doctor said everybody in the town who knew she was saying, you know, there was no mystery here. But the, I guess the patient, the husband was the last to know here. 
in terms of um, least frivolous cases, look, if a patient has a complication, that's an unexpected outcome for them. And to them, that's a big deal. Um, I think one thing to pay attention to is this, that much of the aesthetic world is cash pay. And if you've got a Blue Cross policy, they exclude cosmetic procedures. So what happens if the patient ends up getting a local infection? What if the patient gets a local hematoma? It depends. Blue Cross may not pick up the tab for that. So if the patient has an urgent problem, goes to the ER, they may or may not pick up the tab. I will tell you, we had one client, I would say this was a pretty decent outcome. Um, the, the patient um, was operated on, I think, in Southern California, then went up to um, Washington State and developed post-op day number three, four, developed a hematoma, breast hematoma. And so the doctor says, look, just go to the ER, just get it taken care of. She goes to the ER, on-call doctor comes in, finds a hematoma, removes it, done under general anesthesia. Blue Cross would not pay for it. They basically said, this is a complication of a procedure that we don't cover. We're not covering it. But um, interestingly enough, this uh, the anesthesiologist or the surgeon did a pregnancy test on the patient just to dot all their I's and cross the T's. And to everybody's shock, it was positive. So the patient was pregnant, um, I guess newly pregnant um, at the time she was going to be put to sleep. So the argument that we made was that because they wouldn't pay the anesthesia bill. So the argument was that, well, look, they weren't just taking care of mom, they were taking care of the baby. Anesthesiologists were taking care of the embryo or the fetus, and they accepted that appeal. So they, they bought it, meaning that there are ways to do it. And in addition, if the patient has a systemic illness uh, like sepsis or a pneumothorax, something that's potentially life-threatening, typically on appeal, they will pay for it. But be careful if somebody has just a local infection and they are sent to the ER and now the ICU and they've got tens of thousands of dollars, this could be a potential challenge. So I, I tell people, look, if, if people are spending their last dollar on a particular procedure and they truly don't have the resources to weather a potential storm, just be careful because they're going to be looking you to make that payment, you know, if they can't, otherwise they have to file for bankruptcy. For sure. Well, we're going to wrap it up. I don't know how you're a lawyer. I was going to be a lawyer for about a minute and I realized how negative it all is. Like you have to live in that mindset of what could go wrong. And I didn't. So I went into marketing instead. I thought that was a lot more positive and fun. Um, but good, you know, you're probably doing God's work there. So good for you. Um, I try to maintain a sunny disposition. So my my feeling broadly is that I'm here to solve a problem, not to say no. Good for I, you. I typically say my feeling is yet. It, so I, I have two ways of saying something. I could say no because or yes if. No because or yes if. I try to say yes if more often than not. Good for you, though. Good mindset. Um, so how can others uh, get a hold of you if they do have a little issue and they'd like your two cents? I'll give you my email address. So it's J Siegel, J S is in Sam, E G A L, at medicaljustice.com. And my office phone number is 336 691 1286. And you can just look us up at medicaljustice.com. It's one word, medicaljustice.com. We've been at this now for over two decades. Every time I think we've seen it all, I'm proven wrong. But we have worked with over 11,000 practices across the country over, over two decades. And lots of problems to solve, lots of conflicts. But the good news is most of the time, things go smoothly. Oh, that's a, that's a lot of problems to solve there, 11,000. Holy cow. Um, but thank you so much. I appreciate your time. And I will see you at a conference coming up soon, I'm sure. And everybody, thanks for joining us. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to Beauty in the Biz and share this with your staff and colleagues and anyone else who's interested in the frivolous lawsuits because they're going to happen. They're just going to happen, period. Um, and then if you have any questions for me or feedback, please leave them on my website at katherinemaylee.com or you can certainly DM me at Catherine Maylie MBA on Instagram. Thank you so much and we'll talk again soon. The fastest way to success is to model other successful surgeons who have what you want.
but you can only see their results, not the path they took to get there. So you continue to jump from one thing to another, hoping to find something that will work for you too. But it rarely does. So try this shortcut instead. It's guaranteed to move you forward. I compiled my intellectual property to grow cosmetic revenues, everything I've gleaned over the years into one playbook of the most successful practices and what they do to win. Go to CosmeticPracticeVault.com and let's grow your cosmetic revenues.